I will talk about the largest biotic disaster known for the last 500 million years, the Permian Triassic mass extinction, and more especially about its subsequent recovery during the early Triassic. Uh, the early Triassic is the core of our uh, ECIT uh, project, and it involves uh, four labs in France and eight uh, others uh, worldwide. Uh, okay. Maybe you already know such a graph showing you the evolution of diversity through the Phanoric, through the Phanerozoic uh, during the last 500 million years. Um, and it also shows you um, the five known mass uh, extinction. I think that everybody knows uh, the drastic event that changed the life of dinosaurs uh, at the end of the Cretaceous 65 million years ago. However, a much more severe uh, biotic event happened at the boundary between the Paleozoic and the Mesozoic 252 million years ago at the Permian-Triassic boundary. And this event killed almost all the life on Earth. For instance, more than 90% of marine species disappeared during this event. It also corresponds to the disappearance of typical um, Paleozoic marine um, organisms, and it is also coeval to the, to the appearance of new organisms that will form uh, the modern ecosystems. So this short interval here, a few million years, is key in the evolution of life. And, oops, sorry, and our scientific community spent a lot of effort to try to decipher the potential causes for uh, this mass extinction. All these potential causes are summarized on uh, these small drawings, and it includes, for instance, a meteor impact or a poisoning of oceanic waters. But no, almost all our colleagues agree that the main trigger for this mass extinction is likely the huge volcanic eruption of the so-called Siberian traps, generating, for instance, uh, global warming. It is only recently, during the last two decades, that investigations have been done to try to understand how life recovered after this mass extinction during the early Triassic. The main idea, the main model, was the recovery was slow and delayed due to the magnitude uh, of this extinction. But we'll see that it is not so simple. Let's have a look on the early Triassic. The Permian-Triassic boundary is here, and here you have the short early Triassic interval of about five million years. And it is quite easy to see that this short interval it, uh, corresponds to successive environmental fluctuations, as evidenced, for instance, by the carbon isotopic signal or temperature uh, proxies. Uh, now, we also know different uh, successive biotic events, such as radiation extinction, within the early Triassic, and among one which is extremely important at the Smithian Spatian boundary here, which in terms of intensity revolves with uh, the Permian Triassic mass extinction. Thus, the early Triassic cannot be seen as a homogeneous intervals and devoid of any sign of life. Okay. Uh, Many other hypotheses have been applied to the early Triassic, and for the entire early Triassic. For instance, instance an anoxia, oxinia, uh, more or less global and transient in the ocean, the proliferation of anachronistic facies and disaster taxa, uh, a reef gap, a coal gap, and a chirp gap, meaning that, for instance, metazoan reef uh, totally disappeared during the early Triassic, and also early Triassic organisms are assumed to have been affected by a size reduction uh, phenomenon called Lilliput effect. But now, rapidly, I will show you that these hypotheses have to be uh, deeply uh, revised. The first example, we first opened the debate uh, on the pace of the recovery itself by showing that some, for some nectopelagic organisms, such as ammonoids here and conodonts, this recovery was very uh, rapid. Uh, this graph shows you the evolution of uh, ammonoid diversity from the late Carboniferous here to the late Triassic here. The permanent Triassic boundary is here at the center. And again, it's quite easy to see that ammonoids reach diversity much higher than during the Permian uh, uh, in less than about uh, 2 million years, which is very rapid. Thus, the idea of a slow and delayed recovery for all early Triassic 
uh, organisms uh, is highly uh, dubious. The second example, thanks to exhaustive field studies, especially in the US and the help of many colleagues, we documented several uh, new specimens of large size gastropod up to 10 centimeters, exceeding the uh, commonly assumed size uh, limit for this group of about one, two centimeters. And we also show that this large size gastropod uh, occurred rapidly after the Permian Triassic boundary at a large uh, spatiotemporal extent and uh, are also uh, included in uh, different families. Thus, uh, a Lilliput phenomenon for gastropod is not demonstrable at, uh, at, at, this, at that time and probably result from um, an important sampling bias. It's probably also the case for many other uh, organisms. Thus, if we take into account all the recent data, and uh, for instance, my example, and if we compare them to the classical model of a slow and delayed recovery, this model appears very, very, very uh, dubious. This is all the more interesting as uh, we uh, found new exceptional fossiliferous assemblages that call into question uh, many hypotheses about the early Triassic recovery. And this is the core of our ICID project. Um, all these new fossiliferous ex exceptional assemblages uh, were grouped under the term Paris uh, biota. And this Paris biota was highly unexpected for uh, different reasons. The first one is that it occurs at a time and space and place uh, expected to be um, very unfavorable for many groups. Indeed, it occurs immediately after uh, the major Smithian Spatian boundary event. If you remember, uh, uh, an extinction event which is almost comparable with the Permian Triassic boundary um, event. Uh, Sorry, it does not work. Yeah. Uh, the first fossil site was found uh, near the small city of Paris in southern Inda, uh, Idaho, near Bern, Geneva, and Montpellier, if you want to have the precise geographic locality. Here you have a small map showing you uh, the paleogeographic location of uh, the studied site um, during the early Triassic at a near equatorial position, so something very warm, and on the field, uh, outcrops are not very impressive because they are made of calcareous shale forming small cliff in the landscape, and uh, this calcareous shale um, you know, can be found as slab forming uh, screes. And in the literature, uh, these uh, exposures were first described as totally barren of fossils. But if, whoop. sorry. Not so sensitive. Okay. But if you have a careful look on this slab, this is all the kind of organisms you can uh, you can sample, and you can immediately see that uh, this assemblage is highly diversified and complex. You can find, for instance, uh, cephalopods like this one. You can find echinoderms like ophiurids or crinoids. You can find crustaceans such as tilacocephalan or shrimps. You can find also some strange ponds. And uh, you can also find a lot of other uh, organic remains such as uh, vertebrate teeth or uh, coprolite. Um, remains. Thus, more than 20 clades are represented in this uh, site, which is much more than any, any other known early Triassic assemblages. And uh, you can also see that organisms are relatively well preserved and abundant, implying that they can be relatively uh, easily uh, studied. Um, surprisingly, most of these organisms are new for the early Triassic, and many of them show the oldest presence of derived characters, um, uh, suggesting that they rapidly diversified after the Permian Triassic boundary, but also after the Smithian Spatian boundary um, event. In addition, some specific relationship among these organisms are well visible, which is quite rare in fossil assemblages. For instance, some epizoan on sponges or uh, hooks contain, belemnoid hooks contain included in coprolites, suggesting that 
fishes were eating these organisms uh, during the early Triassic. Uh, the most unexpected uh, thing in this Paris biota was the presence of two organisms which are not supposed to exist at that time. Uh, the first organism is a basal sponge from the early Paleozoic, disappearing during the late Paleozoic and reappearing in the Paris biota 200 million years later. And the second organism is this one. It's a gladius-bearing coleoid, a kind of squid, if you prefer, which is supposed to appear only 50 million years later during the early Jurassic. Thus, we have a very... Okay. We have a very strange uh, assemblage. Uh, and uh, the first conclusion we've made, uh, this assemblage is highly diversified and complex. Uh, we have unexpected an, uh, organisms and not at the right place and time. Thus, it suggests that the early Triassic uh, fossil record is not well known, but it is key to understand the transition between the Paleozoic and the Mesozoic uh, faunas. The main question we had uh, at the beginning of the project it was, is this biota an exception or not? And thanks to the project, we have found four new exceptional fossil sites containing the same kind of fauna, three of the very same age and one slightly younger, but you can see that this uh, fossil site uh, also contains, for instance, uh, uh, crustacean sponges and uh, a lot also of uh, fishes. Thus, they are a subset of the original site, but clearly uh, indicate that uh, this uh, fauna is not an exception, at least in the studied uh, basin, but first result we also have from South China suggests that the similar fauna can be found uh, just after the Permian Triassic boundary, just again uh, implying that the recovery was very rapid. Okay, the last remaining problem we have with our uh, sample specimen is that they are very fragile and uh, uh, they require um, cautious manual preparation to access anatomical characters that are hidden uh, inside the sedimentary matrix but that are crucial for taxonomic determination or paleobiological interpreta interpretation. And to overcome this problem, we begin a collaboration with the Ipanema Labs and some of the bin line at the Synchrotron Soleil to use uh, two new approaches uh, which are in development uh, and which are non-destructive for our sample and which allow to access such crucial uh, anatomical features. The first one is uh, to use uh, micro uh, X-ray fluorescence elemental mapping uh, which clearly allow to go inside the sediment uh, and to not have to prepare manually uh, the specimen and to have access to some anatomical details such as the series here on, on this crinoid or the digestive tract uh, here uh, on these shrimps. Uh, the second methodological approach we are, which is still in development and we are trying to use is uh, the multispectral macro imaging which basically consists to collect images from the UV to the near-infrared uh, domain and to combine this image to enhance uh, contrast. This is rather, uh, rather powerful uh, on some slabs, for instance here on the left, where with your eyes you see almost nothing, only a slight relief, and by using this technique you can see clearly the shrimps which are on these slabs. Uh, it is the same here on this example. And the second use is to clearly combine these images to uh, enhance uh, and obtain the relief uh, for uh, these uh, shrimps. So I will rapidly conclude that we have uh, made successful discovery with this uh, ACID project and we uh, engage new collaboration. And uh, uh, I think that we hope to uh, develop this new methodological approach to try to uh, correct uh, the, uh, and to um, uh, try to find the actual diversity in such um, exceptional fossiliferous site to know better how life recovers after this mass extinction. I thank you for your attention. Yeah. Well, thank you, very for, thank you very much for this talk. Uh, do we have questions in the audience for Arnaud? Yes. 
Thank you for your presentation. Maybe it's a naive question, but how do you manage to find new, new sites? Uh, you, you say that you found three new ones. How do you do that, in fact? I think you, you just have to have the feeling where to find good sites. And, uh, the first site we found, obviously nobody is looking for any fossils inside. But when we, thought, we, when we found the first fossil, we know that in other sites with similar environment, we should find the same. So we explore more and more the same environment in the same basin, and we, we are successful. So uh, you have to, to have good eyes and a good nose, just, and to be lucky. Okay, do we have more questions for Arno Breyer over here? Yes, maybe one last uh, naive question too. So how do you uh, uh, make sure that this is the, the, the actual age of time that you want to look for? I mean, you, you found a place and then, and then you are interested in the Triassic, but, but it could be uh, like, you know, a, anything else, no? I mean, you, you have ways to, to think about it, but maybe you could explain to us uh, how you, you manage to, to make sure that you are considering a place where you, with a perfect time. Yeah, uh, for such a site here, it's quite easy because it's, it's based on biostratigraphic index, such as these small cephalopods, which is an ammonoid, which clearly give us a uh, timeline. So it's easy to, to have uh, an age with such uh, organism here. It's, they are easily recognizable. And these uh, fossiliferous sites, does it work here? Yeah. Uh, you can find these uh, biostratigraphic markers uh, through all the exposure, so you are sure about your age. Okay, it's not obvious for us, no, but it's probably a good question. Yeah. Okay, we have uh, time for one very short question, if there is one. No? Okay. Uh, as we are already late, uh, we have planned to make a short coffee break until 3.45. So please come back at 3.45 for the, uh, the roundtable that is uh, awaiting us. Thank you. <laughs>